I'm Kim Wynick, and I am an artist from Norfolk, Mass. I'm a member of the Foxborough Art Association, and um, I thought it could be fun to show for cable um, a process in doing an original pastel artwork. I've done demonstrations for local art associations and participated in some local, regional, and uh, national shows, and, um, and figured why not give this a shot. So pastels are a time-honored medium. In fact, we can say that the paintings that were done um, in the caves of Lascaux in France were some of the first pastels done with charcoal pigment. And so my pastels are, like this is my palette, and um, no matter what, uh, a pastel artist will always feel like you could get more, you don't have enough. <laughs> um, so uh, today, well, let me show you some of my paintings. Um, this is a painting of uh, Brant Point Light in Nantucket. And pastel is really a beautiful medium because um, it's just pigment in a stick and the artist. There's no intermediary of a brush or any of that. It's just a lot of um, expressive marks chosen by the artist. So uh, this is another pastel that I did. And this is a nice little harbor scene. Uh, I love working in this small size because you can um, capture certain light very quickly. Uh, it's, a, it's a really friendly medium to take on the road. So you'll see I have this one big palette in this nice travel box. And then because uh, you never have enough, like I said, I also brought this wonderful set. This is a plein air set, and plein air is just fancy term in French meaning like full air or painting outside. And this set is designed specifically for painting landscapes outside and you can look at it and kind of feel the colors involved in painting a landscape outdoors, especially in New England, I find. There are landscape sets that you can get for the Midwest, for you know, like where the landscape is all red rocks but this set works really well for me. So if I don't want to bring this heavy box of all these sticks, then that one in a pinch is all that I would need. So today, I'm gonna to work on this marsh scene. This is on the North Shore. It's the Great Salt Marsh. It has a huge artistic history going way back. Like if you go to the Museum of Fine Arts, you'll see all kinds of paintings depicting the Great Salt Marsh, um, you know, kind of, not putting myself up with those artists, but it's such a wonderful spot. And I love painting marshes so much that my husband calls me Marsha, right? <laughs> um, but I'll always take that, right? Um, so I work from photos sometimes in the studio. Uh, pastels get a little messy, so I tend to wear gloves. <clears throat> I feel like your photo doesn't need to be great. You just wanna capture a sense of what's happening um, in your landscape, kind of like a little uh, crutch to lean on. If you have a photo that's too good, I think that you're really too reliant on that. This photo, I'm not gonna let you see too close, but it has like all kinds of water damage and like there's a guardrail in it. I'm not gonna <laughs> show any of that. I'm gonna take some license, but it gives me a good blueprint of where I wanna go. And I have two scenes uh, from a little bit of a different angle on that. And I'm gonna go back and forth between two. And not everyone would work like that. Some people would do a grid and figure out exactly the proportion. In fact, the proportion of this surface that I'm going to use to this photo is not necessarily uh, mathematically accurate, but in the end, I think I can tweak it to get a pleasing composition. Uh, there's some really nice color in here. This marsh scene, I think, was taken in maybe August when some of the greens that are so prevalent are starting to uh, be a little burnt out and more autumn tones. 
The surface that I'm working on is a hard surface. Even when I paint in oil, I don't like painting on canvas because it's too much of a drum. I like that hard edge. And when I work, you'll see that I make hard strokes and I like when they show. The surface comes in this pre-tinted dark gray and that's very uh, friendly. Sometimes if you work on white, it's really too bright. And then as you paint, you can't get anything brighter than the white of your surface. So artists often work on toned surfaces. This neutral dark gray is a really friendly way to start. All right, so where to start? <laughs> um, I just attended a workshop recently and uh, the artist who's done very well with awards and um, she was a, a really nice teacher, set out certain colors beforehand because of course you have this box of just jewel tones and all colors are beautiful. And I stand here and I think, I see all kinds of beautiful colors. It's smart to try to edit. Oh, editing, it's like what the artist needs to do. Um, and it's tricky. So I sat and before we started to, um, to tape, pulled out a few colors um, and just made notes of what the colors look like. So I have a few different values. Values are the lightness or darkness of a color. So I have a few different values of um, some um, reds, blue purples, greens, yellows, colors that I thought would work for this piece. All right, so usually I start with like maybe a hardish pastel in a gray and I make some light-ish notes. Now see that might be a little low, so let's see. Maybe that's my horizon-ish. You'll see there's a lot of ish. <laughs> An artist um, teacher mentioned, like, when you're sketching, make sure that you draw lightly. And if you do these little shapes, you're in a much better way to make corrections. And you know, people constantly say, oh, I couldn't draw a straight line. No, it's near impossible to draw a straight line, you know? But you can draw a straight line if you're drawing something that's three quarters of an inch. So cut yourself some slack, <laughs> set yourself up for success, and draw small marks. All right, so pretending this line's not here, right? I now have my horizon, the trees in the distance, the main trees here and the main trees on the right. And then there's this little stream through the salt marsh and I'm just kind of suggesting that, right? This is kind of too in the middle, so I might try to move it a little bit, sort of. Everything could, you know, is subject to change. We've got these nice red flowers. So, sort of to start. This is the chance to look and decide if I like that, do I want to change something? And when I make edits, I try to use a slightly different color. Of course, the trick is remembering which color <laughs> is the final edit. All right. So <clears throat> before I came in, I did this little drawing. This is my value study. And I started in pencil. You can see it's kind of scratchy. Um, making notes, where are my lightest lights, my darkest darks? Generally, your lightest light is going to be your sky, and then it's whatever's reflected of the sky. So this stream is pretty light. Remember we said value was the lightness or darkness of a color. Um, so we have some darks over by the horizon. Um, and then this whole area of green is kind of the middle tone. And then we have some nice highlights. And so this is... Um, kind of a little bit more graphic version, pushing where are my darkest darks. And here you can see a little bit more the big shapes of a piece. 
Um, the more shapes in a piece, the more complicated the work can get, and that's when it doesn't necessarily feel cohesive. So we're always trying to smush nature into a cohesive shape, and it's kind of fun to wield that kind of power. <laughs> so, um, it's often smart to claim, right, decide what is one of the lightest lights and darkest darks, right? And so I'm going to get in with a couple of color notes, right? Just kind of saying that is a sky color. And you'll see the sky toward the horizon in the reference is generally lighter and warmer. And as it works up to the uh, top of the painting, it'll be a little bit darker blue and a little bit cooler in color. And so this is kind of somewhere in the middle. I'm probably going to select something slightly warm. Yeah, that's nice. And a little lighter for where uh, it meets the tree line. All right, so then darkest darks. Well, my darkest dark isn't the thing way in the distance. It's going to probably be these trees. And I've done these so many times because um, I love this marsh and I have done different versions of this painting through the years. Um, I still have such a struggle trying to get these trees right. All right, so see basic shapes. What's gorgeous about a pastel is, you know, when you have brushes, you have flat brushes. <laughs> that was fun. Um, you have uh, the round pointed brushes. You have um, bright brushes and filberts and all these different sized brushes. And what's great about a pastel is with this one stick, I can use it really fine. I can turn it on its side and use it like a flat brush. So it's kind of nice that in this one stick of pastel, I have a great arsenal of all kinds of different brush marks that I can make. And I want to take advantage of that tool. All right, so a lot of artists in pastel work top to bottom because you'll see that it's dusty and everything falls down. So if I'm trying to keep, say, uh, this part clean, if I did this first, and then I started doing all this green stuff, all of that could land and start to muddy that color, which obviously we wouldn't want. So I'm going to kind of follow that. And you know, there are always these rules in art. You know, don't put your subject in the center with pastel. You don't blend with your finger. Don't, don't, don't. But you know, art is so like, ha ha, that's the rule, but watch what I did. I broke it and I broke that rule well. So. Um, you know, will not hold it against me if you'll see me breaking rules when I say something, but um, if my camera people catch me in a little bit of a, a contradiction, hopefully they'll tell me and I'll explain why that rule breaking uh, works. And sometimes it might just be because I said so. No, that's how it is um, as a mom, not as an artist. And while I try to be, um, logical, you know, sometimes it's I did that because I want to. Um, I'm just trying to claim a couple more colors so that I get more of a sense of the sky. So we have the trees here. I'm going to do this bank of trees now. Now, I could use the same color, but I want to show a lot of depth or pictorial space in this piece. And colors in the distance get lighter and they also get cooler. So I'm going to look for some sort of green that is a cooler tone and lighter than this because everything is in relation to one another. And that looks pretty good. Particularly, um, pastel helps me as an oil painter because I have to make constant decisions like I need a cool, lighter, green and then I find it. So as an oil painter, when I'm mixing color, I've had the opportunity to look at a lot of different color notes and make a lot of decisions. Okay, so now I want to claim what color is going to be my main green. And so earlier I grabbed this cool stick and uh, I don't mean in temperature, I mean that I like it. <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, let's get some nice color in. In my class, which I've been teaching for more than 10 years um, in Walpole, a really stellar group of painters. Um, we are the Neponset Valley artists, hence the NVA on my apron, right? Um, we're always talking about, one of my critiques is always, you want to say the most you can with as little marks as possible. So I want this to look like I did it with ease. And some of it's an illusion, but <laughs> we'll start with that, um, that aim. Okay, so knowing that that color's in, we're gonna have some lighter colors over here where the grasses are turning. And that might be a little bit light. That's not bad. We have this wonderful grass in this foreground and I will want to kind of select what will that look like. And see, I could do this, but that's not as active and dramatic, right, as if we played like that. All right. So the grass in the distance is really um, changing to a, a nice mustardy color. Hmm? You're just wearing one glove. Yes. Yeah, Michael Jackson inspired one glove. <laughs> um, I used to wear two gloves all the time, and I realized only one was getting dirty. So uh, I was like, well, here we go, one glove. What do you do with the other one? <laughs> well, they're the same. Um, the gloves are the, you know, whatever, uh, universal size, right? Fits either hand. And I realized when I was preparing for this demo that I was out of gloves, so I just picked these up at Walgreens. I have no preferred glove manufacturer, which is funny because artists, we are so picky. Ah, that's a better color. Um, that I'm surprised I don't have a, I only use this glove, you know. I just like ones that fit decent. All right, so it doesn't look like much yet, but we'll get there. <clears throat> Green is one of the most difficult colors to get correct. And, um, and of course, I'm a landscape painter, and green is the constant conundrum. Periodically, it's good to stand back and try to take it in. And right now, it's pretty choppy, so when I stand back, I get a little like, oh. I tell my class constantly that pieces go through a yuck period at the beginning. And, um, you know, what a technical term for uh, you're not going to like it at the onset. Um, but it's important to keep going, work through it. And you bring it to a place that you know you can. You were, 
probably drawn to the area for a reason, and it's up to you when you paint to bring that out. Show the viewer why this deserved your time painting it. Mind you, not everything is a success. You know, I'm really banking on this one working out today, but who knows. So I've been talking about warm and cool colors. And the difference would, every color is kind of relative to what's near another, right? So the color green that I'm just putting down now has more blue in it than the other green that has more yellow. And so my goal is to move that back in space slightly. So cool receives. Warm colors come forward and uh, they're also like more intense, so they're gonna have more saturation. And cool colors um, would be pushed back and they gen generally get lighter. And the best example of that would be like blue hills. You know, when we see blue hills, it's, you know, they're looking blue because they're cooler. Like when we get close, they're no longer the same sort of blue that we see from the highway. And the first person to really explore that was Leonardo da Vinci. And now I know you're all gonna rush to your art books and look, but um, like the Mona Lisa has these crazy ice blue caves in the back. And he has a wonderful sense of depth to that painting. Now I'm saying warm colors come forward, cool colors recede, and everything's in relation. So I have this whole bank of this orangey marsh color um, which I think makes for a dynamic composition. Now it goes pushed back because it's all in relation and this in the end is going to be really red and really vibrant. So I think that that will answer to this uh, kind of mustardy yellow color in the distance. Um, so that seemed a little contrary so I should probably explain it. So when we do demos for local art associations, we have um, artists in the audience watching, which puts on the pressure, of course, but it also helps because they ask questions the whole time, um, kind of feeding you along the way with what you need to talk about. And um, one of my camera people, Frank, is one of my students, and um, he's been kind of prompting with key questions along the way which I realize I'm supposed to repeat the question, but. <laughs> He's asking the benefit of pastel, and uh, Frank works in oils, and uh, I've been trying to convert him to what he would say is the dark side to pastel. Pastel, like if I'm going somewhere and I want to paint, and I bring this set, like there's hardly anything to bring. Also, when I want to paint um, uh, quickly, like I don't have to mix, it's just me and some color, like that's kind of cool. Uh, but oils are lovely and I kind of vacillate between the two. I have two young girls and so I've been painting an awful lot with pastel because it works up quick, and when they call me, I can take off a glove and address whatever they, they need from me. <laughs> but you have to wear a glove. I don't have to, but I would just be filthy. And you'll have to tell me if I end up with it on my face, because you know, you have an itch, and you have green hands, and then you have green face. In art school, we were always with some sort of a colored beard of charcoal. So I'm still refining some. Once I settle into a palette, that I'm really comfortable with. Then you'll see some advances, but I would still say I'm in the yuck period. And the benefit to oil would be, you need a color that's slightly different. Well, you mix it on your palette. Here, I find mixing with pastel is different. Like by doing stuff like this, I can put transparent layers over, but it's a, it, it doesn't feel the way that I like to paint. I like to be very, um, kind of aggressive in my marks, decisive. This feels a little better. All right, so I just put this kind of 
I don't know, mustardy, browny green. And you'll see this color, more distant to this bank of trees, is a cooler color. Um, but I want to dull that down a little bit. I have no idea how many colors are in my palette. And um, as a pastelist, I'm always getting more color. Because like I said, no matter what, you don't have the color that you're looking for, ever. Does it change outside versus inside? Painting on location um, gives you some color that is uh, like so affected by the sun. So painting inside uh, and then taking a painting outside, the colors will look a little different. I like painting in the studio because you hang paintings in the house. <laughs> so I want my paintings to look good in the house. Plus it's easier. It's a little easier to paint in the studio as opposed to on location, certainly. When I got here, they asked if I stand or if I sit to paint. It's a good discipline to stand, if you can. I think you're more prone to, um, to stand back and see your progress or, you know, yuck period. But the more I paint, the more I realize that I need neutrals, that neutrals are what lets your painting really come to life. You know, we're always working on improving, and um, that's kind of my goal lately, is to improve how I use my neutrals. Otherwise, it can, again, look like that Crayola box, like too many details, too many color jumps, a little too vibrant. What's a neutral? <laughs> oh, gosh. So Frank just asked, what's a neutral? It's like this last bit of color in my box. Colors that you know, like this is like a red tone, but that it kind of feels like a gray. Anything that feels uh, like a dulled down version of another color, sort of. I try to jump around the, pa the painting. Uh, you don't want to work something up to a different level than the rest. It can feel a little disjointed. Also, you have this fear that you end up loving a part of a painting in one area too much. And then, um, you know, that can be a problem because you won't develop it at the same rate. Why do you rub the pastel on the towel? Well, my hands are filthy, and so I end up with dirty pastels. And if I, like, I have this bluey color. If I drag it over here, now I have green on the pastel. And you're not supposed to uh, blend with your finger, like I said, but kind of erased. I just went to this um, show where they had these pastelists doing demonstrations so that people could watch the process. And it was uncanny because each person, these like really vaunted artists, would make marks on their piece. Ooh, bright. And then they would kind of do this. And I was like, wait a minute, that's something you're not supposed to do. Um, but like everything in art, it's like, but done right, it's OK. Who defines what's right, right? We do. So sometimes there's, um, well, like when you're painting or drawing, there's what we call like the positive sh space and the negative space. And the positive space is what you're painting. So like right now, if I'm painting the grass, right, that's kind of my positive shape. I'm working on the grass. Then I'm trying to get the shape of this little stream of water. And um, I can get that by saying, okay, now I'm going to paint the water. But I can also get that by painting the space around the water and um, concentrating on that kind of a great um, tool to make sure that you've got things accurate. All right, so I'm deciding now, I, I like the way that this feels. I know where my lights are, um, usually a reflection. So in this instance, right, the reflection of the sky is going to be darker than what it's reflecting. 
I feel like there's a sense of depth, right? This is definitely more intense and warmer than these colors. You'll see that that little difference in tone that I made back here kind of sets up that that's behind some of this intense color. It's important, and you'll see that as I develop the piece, that this color and this color are similar but actually different, yet our eye wants to make things match. And so this color and this color, although different, when we look at it, I think people would think it was the same color. So I'm going to have to change that, probably make it more orange and this one more vibrant red. And even though it's a grassy scene, at this point, I'm trying not to do a lot of these verticals um, that are small because it can get so busy that way. We want to try to convey the overall plane of where the light hits all that grass as one mass. And later in the piece, I'll show some verticals, but hopefully not too many. So I just used a color that's kind of pink. And yet, when I made that mark, it looks white and it's garish. It's too light. So I'm going to use this brush and just kind of erase it. Moves the pigment, um, kind of acts like an eraser. There's some areas that the pigment is like just a little too strong. Um, and I'm going to use the brush to remove. Now, I can also, if my brush is clean, like try to blend, but look, it just makes a mess. <laughs> um, so that's why people use their finger and kind of blend. See, I'm kind of burnishing it in. But I think that like there's an activeness and over here, where over here I've kind of flattened and deadened. So we're going to have to play with that. But that's a really good case for why you don't um, blend. I think too, it's nice to see the decisions of the artist being made. Like that's kind of an active attractive combination of marks and shapes, whereas that just becomes this flattened blah. And then you lose your uh, fingertips because uh, it's a sanded surface, which is helping it grab. Um, and so when I work on sandpaper or other things, like if you blend like that, you do lose your finger fingerprints. One thing I'm learning too, I mean, we're always learning, is if I look at this distant bank of trees, which I have considerably altered, you know, that goes on for quite some time, and I've made it a little bit more um, about these two, so I've certainly increased that scale. I see a bunch of color notes. I mean, there's maybe some houses back there, so there's some dark, some lights, all kinds of stuff, but for the purpose of the painting, we just need to simplify, but right now that's still one color note. So I'm trying to decipher another color note and it's important as I decide what that note is that it's dark enough that, that people at a distance right can see it so something like that feels nice and with a few marks right on the side of this pastel um, I should be able to do that right so now I have some different light hitting that bank of trees This might be a good time for me to change my glove. They get so dirty. And see, now it's almost like I just used one pair. <laughs> and while I'm doing that, step back, take a look. I think I need a darker green that's nice and warm toward the foreground. And like I said, green is always tricky. And look at that, I didn't even grab green, I grabbed purple, but that was deliberate, I'm not colorblind. Local color is the term that we use for color that is something, right? So when we're painting green, we choose green and use green, um, that's local color. I like to try to entune other colors though, right? So there's like some shaded darker parts in this green and the color of the light there and the, 
in, in, uh, on location versus what the camera does in the printout, that just deadens what that is. So if I look at this, like the color, the vibration there is so much more interesting than if I just painted a dark forest green. There's a nice little shadow row where, the, um, where these red reeds meet. So I'm trying to depict some of that. And this color is pretty much a blue, slate kind of blue color. All right, we're getting there now. And see, you, you can almost imagine if this were an oil, that would be a nice, wide, flat brush. And you'd mix that color and make that mark. And so when I discuss in class how you want to make your color note and get out, like you can, with oil and with pastel, um, get these nice marks. It's important to modulate your marks through the painting so that it moves the viewer around, right? If the whole piece were just these little similar dots, um, it could be a little boring. We want to mix it up. So I changed gloves and immediately went for dark colors, which was very silly. I should have given myself some nice uh, clean gloves for at least a minute. Trying to get some of that uh, action back. I'm going to... All right. So now I'm at a point in the piece that I want to um, start to refine. Uh, some people who like a little bit more abstract would say, oh my gosh, you're done, you know. Uh, some people who want something a little bit more realistic are like, no way, keep going. So I try to find somewhere in the middle. As you get to the end of a painting, like some of my students will say they like to start paintings in class because a lot of us have been painting together for a long time and of course we're friendly. But you know, like painting takes concentration. We're constantly having these conversations in our head in a good way, right? Where uh, we're asking like, is that color note right? What kind of mark do I need to make? And um, at the beginning, you can be a little bit more cavalier and take risks, but toward the ends of the painting is when your marks are going to matter. So, despite the fact that I'm talking, I'm trying now to bring it a new level of paying attentionness. <laughs> I tend to make up words in class. We want like our own little dictionary. So there's something that I'm not liking about this horizon, that we have this, then this, then this. I'm going to make this smaller because I feel like it's really throwing this into the center, uh, kind of like dumbbells, even though they're not evenly weighted. So um, I will do that by taking this kind of pinky tone, right, and coming in on that shape. Now I have a bunch now that are very evenly spaced and of course I don't like that either but this is where we can really play. And sometimes if I do that that's the um, the blending with my finger that's because the edge was too dramatic um, the edge are where two colors meet and in the distance you don't see really crisp edges you see things that are softer so I don't want edges in the back to be too um, sharp so you'll see just with a careful finger blend minor um, I change that edge but I don't flatten it to, to death you know I just try to soften I'm so tempted to say, 
And so we'll take a break, and then when the cameras start up, I'd be in a whole new place, you know, kind of like a cooking show. But um, let's see, we'll keep going. Do you want to take a break? No, oh, no, I'm okay. So in the distance, which you can't really see, and I had started to address, there, um, you can't see it great in the photo either, but I'm going to stress it in the painting, is the little stream that's running through to this main subject here. Um, so I want to find a color. Now we know that the water reflecting is this wonderful blue, but that's because this is closer to us, right? And I have a nice gradient in the sky that starts warm. So the water over here and over here is going to be the water reflected that's closer to the horizon. So my marks um, and the color need to be closer to there. So we need to be warmer. Um, so just to explain that I'm not being contrary, <laughs> even though that's kind of fun, um, that that is how it is. That's kind of some nice water. It's a little intense, but I will small in those shapes by painting the space around it. So again, in this instance, the water I'm concentrating on is the positive shape. And when I paint the grass around it, I'll be concentrating on the negative shape. Did you just say small in? Sm oh, I did on great. That's one of my favorite non-word words, small in and ambiguous. Everything gets that, yeah. Uh, in class, the critique or the little advice will be, you need to, uh, and blue in, like those aren't even words, sorry. Only a little sorry though. All right, so those are definitely big. So let's, uh, I spent a little bit of time now on the sky, right? I addressed some of those trees. Now I'm gonna start to continue to refine the, um, this body of color in the back. How do you know when you've done so Frank just asked the question that I'm sure as he's asking, he's like, cause I would really like to know, like every artist wants to know, how do you know when you're done? And um, why Frank, do you think I'm done? <laughs> I can't see. Oh, okay, cause I'm not done. Um, it's funny, you're generally done with a painting earlier than you think. Uh, in terms of being like a painter who's not doing something photorealistic because, um, you know, like these marks are fresh and interesting. So a nice little guide is you're done. Like when you think you're 75% done, stop and sit with your piece for a spell because um, when you go back to it, say three days later, you might only need uh, 20 or less marks to make the painting say what's necessary. So uh, when am I done is a question that's near impossible to answer. <laughs> You're done when you feel done. And when is that? Who knows? You know, um, some pigment is really soft and some pigment is just um, hard no matter what brand because there are different brands of pastel. Some are round and some are the square. And the square ones are great because you can get all kinds of wonderful edges, but they're also great because they don't roll. <laughs> so when you put it down, it's not gonna roll on the floor and crack into a zillion pieces. Um, but every single stick in this box like isn't the same brand. And, um, and as you become familiar with the brands, you know by looking, you know, which ones are soft, which ones are hard. Um, and they all are part of your tools. See, this one is too hard for what I want to do. But of course, it's the right color, too hard. That's a problem. Oh, that's better. Right, so in the foreground, these marks that I'm making that are horizontal are because all of those grasses, we can't see them. So I can, I can make their note, right, for the viewer by making these nice horizontals. If I were using, um, if I were painting similarly in the foreground, right, then it would be too, um, it would kind of be lacking the detail that we wanna see. 
So that's why in the foreground, I don't like that color. In the foreground, you know, the, the same grasses become that kind of shape. And um, as artists, we have kind of like our own uh, trademarked, <laughs> our own habit of the marks that we make. Way too dark, yikes. Um, and mine is very slashy. And I'm often trying, yeah, to compensate for that slashy mark that I make. And in the foreground is where that mark becomes more evident because you notice the marks. Yeah, that's kind of good. So this color that I'm using is certainly more neutral, right? A little bit grayed. So uh, this easel is wonderful. Uh, I can adjust it, and the legs are adjustable. And if I'm painting outside, I can set up on like a rocky jetty and adjust the legs. Uh, and then it has these so that I can hold my board, and I can hold a canvas, and it expands so I can do something like 40 by 40. So Frank just asked why I keep moving my board around, and it's because I don't want the painting behind my little holders to be neglected. So I just try to, because look, uh-oh, problem. So we're going to edit some of this, I hope, because you don't want to see every brush stroke. <laughs> All right. Well, some of you do. Maybe if this is airing, like, during a sleepless night. So pastels are very color fast. Uh, they won't fade. You know, it's just you with pigment, which is really lovely. Um, but they do smudge, you know, like you've seen. I could take my finger and mess this up. So when you frame it, it does need glass, um, which is nice uh, to protect the piece, but you don't have the same sort of, um, I don't want to say durability because that puts pastel in a bad light, but uh, like if I were to ship this somewhere, it's not as easy to do as if I were to ship an oil painting, but it can be done. So you don't need glass for oil painting? You do not need glass for oil painting. Frank's filling in my assumptions, which is good. So I'm feeling like some of the colors are a little uh, jazzy. And so this is where I start to look for colors that might have a little bit more of a grayed tone. So see this note that I just made has a little bit more of a gray to it than the bold greens. And when I look at my reference, some of these shapes um, and color notes uh, move my eye throughout, right? So this curving like that is um, a good shape. And then I have this duller green that I notice here and it kind of curl, curls around. So I want to do that because I want to keep people moving. So if it moves your eye up here, then you'll catch the water. Interesting tree that'll become more interesting, hopefully, you know, back to the water and around. So compositionally, God, that could be its whole show. Everything with art could be its, whole, its own show. There's always more to learn. You know, if I watch art shows on television, I'm always like, why aren't they addressing something? Get to it. And I wonder if anyone who would watch would be like, why isn't she touching that? She hasn't touched that. Um, so I'll just pretend that's happening, you know, like little conversations with imaginary people. So there is this small... Um, area of probably dead brush that looks purple. And so I just made this little light purple gray note. And when I think about it, that just might make this painting have too many colors. So I'm going to do that little blending trick to get rid of it and um, continue to work on what I have. Because when we think of it, right, I have these 
reds, and then I've got this aggressive green, and then I've got these purples that I added, and then I have mustard, and then I have these blue trees, and lighter blue-green, and then, you know, we have to kind of edit a little. Our class meets for a couple hours, and then when we're done, I call everyone for critique, and everyone puts their work up, and we talk about it. And one of the things that um, I talk about is a story from when I was studying painting, and I had done like a background, and it had these little dots in the sky, and my professor was like, wow, these dots are beautiful, and I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to take credit for those. Those just happened. And she said, yes, but you left them. And that really stuck with me. And so I'm always, you know, maybe to the <laughs> bane of my class saying that story because sometimes in art, it isn't the mark you make, but the mark that happens that you decide to keep, you know. So there's some, like the, I made that little quick sky hole, very technical term, right, <laughs> for that. I kind of like how that feels. Um, there's some really nice blending of color over color that happened over here that I like. Now at the beginning I said you don't want a piece of your painting to become too precious, but we're getting to a point now that some of these marks can be the final marks. And so I might now choose to leave that. And that again is like that critique comment you know, this looks really nice. Well, that just happened, and it's yes, but you left it. All right, so I'm going to be a little quiet for a few to make a couple of marks. All right, so this is good to me, but this is not right. This, because it's in relation to the other colors, is too light. Um, 50, 58. 58% <laughs> done. Frank just asked where I thought I was done, you know, toward completion. I'm sure if I stood over there, you know, I would think I was more done. But when you're right up on it, it's like, ay. So what's the size of the board you're working on? If I guessed, because I threw away the wrapper, <laughs> uh, it would be 11 by 14, I think. So does it take longer to bigger the painting? Yeah, I can do small paintings very quickly, uh, bigger the painting a little bit more time. Um, I don't like that color. Now would it take longer for oil or, or quicker? I feel like oil paintings work up faster. I mean, work up slower than pastels. Pastels go fast for me. Um, Why? I have uh, more, when I do an oil, I'm very, you can see, I make these marks, I'm like, yeah, that's the color. And then with oil, if I do that, I have this big wet mass of oil, and then I'm like, oh, that color's not right. And then I try to get rid of it, and then I make another mark, and it all gets muddy. So I tend to have to work slower. And I'm not saying that um, I won't get it, but I have to, like, with oil, stop and really analyze, is that the color that I want to do this with? Um, so it takes me a little bit longer time with pastel. I feel I'm a little more cavalier. And you know, I think that that sense of being a little cavalier comes across in the work and that it's appealing, <laughs> right? Like it's these kinds of marks, a little slashy, that make the piece feel active and interesting. And I want to see the things that, um, that an artist does. Like, when I go to a museum exhibit and they have unfinished works by like, you know, really famous people, those are the pieces that I go to see because you can have a glimpse. 
into their thought process, which, like, that's, that's invaluable stuff. All right, so what do I need to do? I need to play with some of that color. I need to refine this tree, and like I said, that tree and that, those are shapes that I struggle with every time I visit this marsh. I don't like some of this bank over here. Uh, I might need to build up some of the color over here so that it feels unified. But we're getting there. We might be in the 60s of done, 60, 60 change. So at the 75%, do you stop? In theory. In theory, you know, at 75%, you're like, all right, well, I'm going to put it away now. So then there's this thing that happens, right? Like, see, I made these few little marks with this color. And I like those. Those are getting toward the end of that area. It starts to set up a hierarchy of, like, where the side of the um, grasses are for that little stream going through. And that's when you can get very excited about marks that you're making and decisions that you're making. And so the caution is not to do them too often, like because we joke about this in class too. It's the I'm an artist, right? Where you have a color you like and you're like, I'll just put it over here. And then, oh, look, I like it so much. Oh, look, it goes over there. And I like it over there, you know? So next thing you know, you have peppered your piece with this one color. And I call it the I'm an artist. So you've got to use restraint, especially toward the end of your piece. If the piece is starting to look too choppy, too, there's nothing wrong with making huge strokes that will unify. We have um, this one woman who did a demonstration in oil for Foxborough Art Association. And she's working up a portrait all in oils and then it gets all juicy and there's these beautiful strokes and it looks just like the model and you're all excited. And then she took her palette knife out and went and scraped the whole thing down. And you should have heard from the audience, ah, you know. And what was beautiful is, remember we talked when I was painting here about edges, where edges can be too hard, where one color meets another or one darkness meets another. And so by taking her knife and scratching the whole thing down, scraping the whole thing down, she softened everything. And this portrait was beautiful. And then she goes in and decides where does she want things to be hard and where does she want things to be even softer. And so I think with pastel, like the same effect is given by doing something like that. I'm an artist. Right, so we think about the planes of the marsh, right? There's the top of the grasses where the light hits, but then you also have to get the sides. And so that's what I'm going to concentrate on now. There's um, a spray fixative that you can use on pastels that will prevent them. See, this pastel's too hard. Prevent them from um, being too fragile. Um, but artists don't like to use the fixative because it flattens out your color. If, um, if I weren't in studio right now and I could take it outside and I had brought it, I might spray fixative at this point because it alters your um, colors, kind of flattens them down a little bit. But it gives a good base. So then I would do kind of some finish marks um, on top That's one of those rules, like you'll talk to people and you're really like, I never use fixative. And then you'll talk to someone, I only use fixative, you know, and you're like, I don't know what to believe. So when you take this home, you have to be careful? Yes. I will be very careful transporting this home.
One of the first demonstrations I did, um, I remember this great sense of relief when I was like, you know, if I make a mistake, like that's actually an excellent teaching moment, so I should relax. <laughs> um, but still, you want to do your best. So there's, like I was saying, there's a lot of conversation. Do I like this? How does that read? And then, you know, covering up your reference and looking at it. Am I happy with, you know, how it's reading all together? Without knowing what that is, does this speak enough on its own? Uh, you want your painting to be about interesting shapes. This is in the distance. I don't want it to be too detail detailed. But then I want it to feel believable. There are these, like, sky holes in it, right, where the light comes through. Um, I don't want to do too many. I don't want to do them the exact color of the sky because they're influenced by the tree around it. The class, the line I'm always using is, you know, like, decide what your mark is, make it, and get out, right? Because you can very quickly lose the interesting things in your painting by overworking something, right? So I like a lot of this, but it, it could read a little flat, so I want to decide, do I need some more marks? Is this the right color? It's just enough of a difference, so I'm going to suggest just a few things. Okay, so just trying to give um, a little bit more definition. And then um, I'm going to get rid of something because it felt like an eyeball to me, <laughs> like some sort of weird animal that I just made. So we're going to soften some of that. Now in the way distance, I'm going to change up just a little. So these are some of the finish marks toward the back. The sky's not done, but like, you know, now I'm really trying to figure out what do I need to do to get this done? because I'm sure these camera people are getting tired of <laughs> watching this process, you know, but also you, you don't want to just beat around the bush, like get to it. Um, you know, kind of like when I have to fold laundry and I decide I'm going to do everything else in the house but fold laundry, and then I still have to fold the laundry after I've done everything else, so just get to it, right? So I'm going to... That's kind of pretty. Might be a little too light. Did you just put on another glove? I did. I was working on lighter colors and in the um, sky. So I wanted to um, have a nice clean glove to just get dirty again. I like this kind of glow. want to kind of warm this up, but still keep it the right level of dull. Sounds like such a contrary thing, but not really. Oh, that's kind of good. We have some people in my class that um, we know all the decisions they're making because they talk us through them in class, right? I need a dark green, you know. <laughs> but in art, you find yourself talking to yourself all the time. Right. Let's go in like that. So there's like these tiny trees in the distance. Maybe I'll be ridiculous and see if I can get them in. We'll see. Here goes nothing. And if I don't like them, right, what's the harm? I just blot them out. Nah, I don't like them.
You know, when I first started painting, I was all about painting to have something look really just like the subject. And the more I paint, the more I move toward abstraction. And um, that it needs to convey a feeling. It's not so much about being a real perfect depiction. And I talk to a lot of artists who are kind of in that same boat. The more you paint, the more you paint that feels like paint, feels like and the artist's hand was in there. All right, that's not bad. So I like that I have a certain softness here. Um, let me try something. Yeah. See, I just put in this kind of more of a turquoisey color in key places. Kind of really pushes that back because that might be a little further back than some of this. All right, I kind of want to play with this a little. You know, I see so many beautiful colors, but you have to decide like which ones are right. Like there's definitely some gorgeous red rust salmon-y tones in there. But if I put those there, they're going to be the same colors that are down here. And all this work that I'm doing to try to put the viewer to know that that's way in the distance um, will be foiled because if the color here is noticeably the same color here, our eye will put this and this on the same plane. And so all that work to try to make it feel like it goes back in space will be for nothing. And, you know, you've been watching all this work. <laughs> it would be awful to have that for nothing. I need something that's a little bit lighter. Ah. So this pastel is small and um, hard, and it's called a new pastel, N-U, not N-E-W. And um, you can get in some nice marks. You know, like, it's good to use these kinds of colors to suggest things. Like, see, just these few marks can be all I need to suggest, right, that there are grasses there. And just those marks are all we need. We always want to try to say as much as we can with as few marks as we can. The hard pastels don't just make a mark. They also scratch away the other marks. Um, and that's kind of a cool tool, too. So you can see where parts feel now, like from top to bottom. We're getting to a nicely completed section here. This is feeling a little neglected, but better when I added that kind of uh, where the sun hits the top of that plane. Uh, this is sorely neglected, but we'll get to it, and we'll start to play in here slightly. But trying to be logical, top to bottom-ish. And there's a balance, like how much detail do I want? What, what is really important to convey? The more marks that I make, the softer the pastels need to be to go on top of them. Sometimes some unexpected color goes a long way. Um, you know, like this is this cocoa brown kind of color. And I think from a distance, a painting might pull you in. Um, but it's when you come up closer because it pulled you in that you want to notice these color choices that you might not see from a distance. And um, that those should uh, make the viewer react and hopefully react positively. Ah, 
That was wrong. That's better. You know, sometimes when you use a color, um, it's kind of as an eraser or as a unifier. If I'm using a color on top of others, right, it kind of acts as a colorless blender. You know, and if you don't have any art supplies and you're interested in getting started, I think the best thing to do is just to draw in black and white because those, uh, that observation you do will come in so handy, right? Where things are dark and light and where transitions are from dark to light, all of that is invaluable. We work with value all the time. So this right here is a little aggressive where there's that stripe of dark with the stripe of green. So I wanna soften that. That's where I can do something like use another stick and kind of bridge and blend without it being uh, over blended or flattened. I can add another color, right? To kind of try to break something up. Well, this is probably 74%, and this is probably in the 60s. How about you, Frank, though? You can't see it? I can't see it, except on the monitor. <laughs> well, that's kind of good. One thing we talk about in class is directional mark making and how important that is, you know, like, when I'm painting the grasses in the vertical, it makes a difference. It informs the viewer. When I'm trying to flatten something out, you know, and I make these little horizontal marks, that's important. I painted the trees going up. Um, everything helps convey your message to your um, to the viewer. That was a quick hour and a half. I mean, for me. <laughs> All right, so why don't we take a break and I'll make a couple more marks and then maybe bring it to conclusion and um, show you or, I don't know, explain the couple of things that I did to finish in the foreground. All right, so thank you. So during the break, I did some work to the piece. And as this was a demo, I made a little bit more marks than I might normally um, in my studio or even on location. I might take my time a little bit more. But I didn't want you to be bored watching the process. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of things going on at home uh, after letting it sit for a little bit. I'm going to maybe simplify, decide which marks are the most important. But overall, I'm happy with this composition, feeling like it moves us throughout um, the painting. And I think you get a sense of how I take a picture you know, that I've taken and um, take license with it. Right, like hopefully this brings you to a different place than this, but this was my, um, my starting point and let me depart from there. Um, and so, you know, per my conversation during the show, this might be a little more than 75%. And sometimes the end of, you know, like that last 25% isn't necessarily making marks. It is analyzing where it's at. So um, I'm not happy with some of the marks over here. I am happy with parts in the distance. Um, and I wanna kind of simplify over here a little bit more. But thanks so much for, you know, tuning in and watching the process and hopefully we'll do it again. Thank you.